Hi, my name is Keith Cooper and in this short video I'm going to look at using black and white images to change the tonality of colour images. In particular I'm going to take a colour image, I'm going to convert it to black and white and then I'm going to use that black and white image just to change the luminosity of the colour image. Now, I've written a few articles about this in the past um, with examples on it, but I thought I'd show it here with a print on this Epson P7500 that I'm currently testing. Why would you bother going to the trouble of producing a black and white image to change colour image? The black and white image that you make, you can change the tonality, all kinds of aspects of local contrast. You can add things like structure in it. Certainly if you use a tool like Nick Silver Effects, which I've used for years. Um, it must be 15 years since it first came out, I've used versions of it. Now I've got lots of written articles which long predate my making uh, videos, which go into this in more detail if you're curious. But just because I'm using silver effects to generate the images here doesn't mean you can't use any other technique for making black and white images for the same effect. It's just easier to show with silver effects. Have a look at the articles if you're not sure. I've got far more examples which show how the colour tonality changes when you do a, a blending. Uh, we're using a luminosity blend. Now, I'll start off with an image I took a few years ago. This is on the pier at Cromer in Norfolk, on the North Norfolk coast. And it's taken around dusk. Uh, you can see there are actually lights on on the pier and it's wonderfully empty. It was uh, a day in, oh, I don't know, April or something like that. Not many people about. There was a slight chill in the air. Um, it's, it's getting dark. I want to get a print of this which captures the look of chroma pier. It's taken with an 11 millimeter lens on a full frame camera, 50 megapixel 5DS, so quite a big file. And the picture itself I quite like, but it just could do with a little bit more to give a bit more of how I felt the scene, how it felt to me when I was there. Now, there are lots of ways you can process and lots of tools you can process, but this process of producing a black and white image, changing the tonality and then merging back of a color image is one that I've not seen discussed that often. Now I'm doing this in Photoshop. In fact, it's an old version of Photoshop on this, uh, this computer here, this is CS6. You can do the same thing in Affinity Photo and look out for blending modes in quite a lot of plugins and tools that are available. They often uh, have ways of blending the results back with the original image. Now, it can look truly awful. I'm immediately reminded of the craze for the HDR look in color images that uh, still refuses to go away. Um, people kick it, but it's not quite out yet. Um, I really dislike color HDR style tone mapped images. Um, they, they produce a, a sense of physical discomfort in me. I'll go that far as to, to complain about them. But anyway, here's a basic color image. It's a bit flat. The sky, there is detail in the sky, but I haven't tried to process the raw file, which I've just processed in Camera Raw. I haven't tried to push the contrast or do anything fancy with it. Um, I think I prefer to just generate a good color file and then process that afterwards. Of course, like all of these things, there's lots of different ways of achieving broadly similar results. This is just one technique that I'm going to outline that might be of interest for some experiments. So there's the image. Now, when I open this image up in uh, Nick Silver Effects, and this is the latest version, there are, there are demos of this if you want, but this would work exactly the same if you were to get one of the old original free versions, the old Google version, anything. If you can still run it, you can do this. It's immediately obvious I've cranked up the local um, structure, uh, which is localized contrast, and I've got much more action in the sky. I've got much more detail everywhere because I've, I've stretched the contrast a bit. Now, for a black and white print, that might not look too bad. But for this particular image, I want the color. I want that cloudy evening feel to it. 
but I want a few bits of colour in it as well, just to give the right feel for it. So there's the image that I produced with uh, Nick Silver Effects. Now, if I merge that and I take that and then add it, it when you produce the image with Nick Silver Effects in Photoshop, you get your colour image and then you get a new layer with the Nick Silver with the black and white uh, image on it. What I can do is that layer, black and white one, which is above the colour one, I can change the blending mode of it to luminosity. Now, what that means is that the luminosity of the silver effects image, the black and white image, is applied to the colour image. Now, you may find you need to vary the amount, the opacity of that layer, so you can adjust it from 0% where it has no effect, up to 100% where it will have quite a pronounced effect. Adjust to taste. And what I often say with these things, quite often, adjust to the point where you think it's too much, and then back off a bit. That's better, I find, than trying to just keep nudging it up until you're happy with it. Go too far, step back. Seems to work with a lot of adjustments about this. So here's the image. It looks not much different, certainly on this screen here. And this is a, you know, this is a fairly small gamut screen, not a great screen to edit things on that. I've done the editing work on this on my main uh, machine and with a much better monitor. So I'm happier that the colors look right. But what you can see is that the color is there and it's been, it's almost like a colorized view of the black and white image. Now, additional things I've done for this particular image, I've reduced the color saturation of the sky to make sure it pushes it to very nearly gray. I don't want color in the sky. Um, and sometimes when you do adjustments, you can see a slight tint of color, which you don't really want. And I've also upped the saturation of the boards here. And one other little bit that I did, I've also applied a warming filter, and this is just you know, for this particular image, in the area around where the lights are, uh, on the uh, planks down there, just to warm the image ever so slightly and give a feel that there is a light coming from those lamps that are there. But the main thing is, it's a look along the pier. Now, Obviously, I had to line this up quite carefully. Um, this was taken of 11 mil lens, so any sort of slight uh, you know, movement like that or slight skew will cause problems. So it took a while to do it. I didn't have a tripod with me. This is another one that's handheld. Yes, I'm quite happy taking handheld 50 megapixel images. Um, I don't have a problem with it. And for my architectural work, yes, I'll take a tripod with me. But when I'm visiting a pier on the North Norfolk coast, I probably haven't got a tripod with me. So there is the image there. Now that's 50 megapixel. I could print that at a fair size, not a problem. I'm actually going to up the resolution of this using a gigapixel AI because it also conveniently sharpens the image as well. So I'm just going to take this image, save it as a TIFF, and then I'm going to put it into um, gigapixel AI and I'm going to do a two times enlargement. What it means is that a print on this will come out at about 450 pixels per inch. So nice high resolution. I can see the difference between the sharpening. Now, you might want to, with tools like this, experiment to see which looks best. I can, there are different AI models you can apply with things like Gigapixel AI. Have a look at them, experiment with them to see what it is. Because sometimes, the output from it can look just a little clean. I prefer it still with a slight feeling of noise and a bit of, a bit of almost like a light, very faint grain in the image. It's from the noise from the sensor. It's because uh, I probably underexposed the original somewhat. This was just after I'd got the 5DS. So I was still experimenting with it and didn't know its characteristics that well. But anyway, I have an image there. Um, I have a file that's nice and big. Um, I've got the lights. I'm happy with the detail on it. All I need now is to print the image. Right, well, I've, I've pressed the print dialog here, opened it up uh, on Photoshop, and I've got the image. I've 
set the paper size for 24 inch by 36. This is just a uh, normal basic luster paper. It's equivalent to Epson uh, Premium Luster 260. So it's thick enough not to cause problems take handling the prints. So remember that if you get a big printer, get thicker papers. They damage far less easy than uh, some of the thin papers which can crease if you're not careful. So I've got this, I've got it set for 472 pixels per inch makes no real difference you don't need the exact numbers anymore it's sufficiently high I've looked at the image I've not needed to do any additional sharpening on it because the gigapixel AI resizing has given a sharp degree of sharpness that I know prints quite well now if you're using gigapixel AI for images and you're not going to be using them for uh, print and stuff like this, you may find you want to reduce the effect somewhat. Um, there are various ways you can do this. I've got some articles about resizing images and how, how you process the images that go into the resizing software makes a big difference to what comes out at the other end. Because sometimes if you're not careful, you can resize camera noise, all kinds of artifacts, that you don't really want. Now I've addressed that and I'll put some links in the notes with this video to the actual some of my other experiments um, using this for resizing. But I found that if the image is good enough to start with, a resizing to make a larger print just gives a nice amount of sharpening as well. But anyway, we've got that set there. I've set it for maximum quality using the black optimizer. I'm using a custom profile I built for this particular paper. And uh, so it is time just to press print and wait for the laptop to do its stuff. Now I'm printing this at the highest quality and it's telling me that it's going to take 15 minutes. So a print at lower print qualities can be done at this size can take only a few minutes. 15 minutes, that's quite reasonable. The printer is just working slower because uh, I've set the quality to high. Now I'll have a look. Well, the leading edge of the print is coming out here and it's looking nice and sharp and the colors look spot on. It's still saying 12 minutes, so it's gonna be a while yet. Now here we've got six minutes left and I have a problem which is something I've occasionally had making large prints. And this happens when you make large prints. It happens probably be this time because um, I haven't been making very big prints for a while. And this is a new image. What I can see is a white mark on one of the boards that I'd simply not noticed at the smaller scale I was looking at the image on. It shows that there are seagulls in the area. Now, I've been able to very easily use the uh, healing brush to get rid of that and a few other uh, marks that I'd not spotted before. But what it does mean is that I have a print here where the eye is drawn to a small white dot in the foreground. Now, I could cancel it and run it again. What I've decided is I rather like, even at this stage, the look of this picture. So I will print this one off so you can see this for the video. But actually, I've got some thicker, better paper. And I'm going to do myself a print of this one because I rather like it. I like Chroma as a place. This reminds me of going there. And, um, well, this is a second. Uh, it has... Uh, yeah, presence of seagulls on it but we'll have a look when the print actually comes out of the printer and see if you notice it there we go there's the print there is the image now Maybe you can spot where the seagull was present. Maybe you can't, but I assure you that once you've noticed it on a print this size, you won't not see it. So that's a test print. It's on a light, cheap paper. 
I would suggest if you're going to get a printer like this, you get yourself a supply of basic paper like this to learn the ropes, to, to get the feel for how images are going to print. Uh, because you will make mistakes, but um, it's rather nice seeing the picture at this size. And I'm now going to work on the image and produce a version that I'm happy to actually put up in my home. This sums up a lot of what I feel about visiting the Suffolk and Norfolk coast. However, just one note, this is an image that appeals to me. This may not be the most sellable print ever made of, of the view of Chroma Pier. Remember, there's a big difference between what you yourself might like as a print and what people will stop and buy. And also, one other problem with prints this size, you rapidly find that people don't have walls big enough for them. So this does make a nice A3 Plus print as well. But I uh, hope that's been useful. Um, I found using Nick Silver Effects to change luminosity contrast in colour images distinctly useful over the years. Um, I don't do images like this very often, but it's just one of those tools that's useful to experiment with. And as I say, you can do it with any black and white conversion tool that you've got, or any process that you like. It's mainly about the luminosity blending. So, hope that's been of interest. Do check the references with the article. I'm going to put links to other articles and the likes. Please subscribe to the channel if you find it useful, and uh, I'll see what I can print next time. Thanks.